Good morning YouTube. This is going to be part of a two-part video series and it's going to be on Native American style brush warfare. And what my plan is, because Native American style brush warfare came about in the early 1600s after first contact with the Europeans, particularly the French. In 1609 Samuel D. Champlain, who was aligned with Wendat the Huron and the Algonquin, when he opposed, they, they, they told him, we need your help fighting the Mohawk, the Iroquois. Well, at, in, up at Ticonderoga, which is only about 45 minutes north from me, in Ticonderoga in 1609, Samuel B. Champlain had three guns. Uh, some, stories, some stories say match lock, some say wheel lock. Given the complexities of wheel locks and their cost, I'm going to probably go with match locks. They were more common at that point in time. At 1609, and what happened was, is... Uh, the Iroquois Indians and warfare of Native Americans at that time, especially up here in the Northeast, was they would wear wooden armor. They would have, basically, they wouldn't really be helmets, but they were protected mostly from glancing blows from arrows and from somebody going and hitting them with like a stone tool or something like that. You really didn't have a lot of metal tools yet. because you didn't have a lot of the trade started here yet. Well, what happened was the Samuel D. Champlain fired into the, into the Mohawks. And killed quite a few, didn't kill a lot of them, but he killed a few number of their chiefs. And it basically, the, the Mohawk, it caused a rout. They had never seen anything like this. They had never, they'd never even imagined what a gun could be. So the next thing that the Iroquois did was they started to talk, because the English were not a power here, they started talking to the Dutch. By 1614, the Dutch had built Fort Nassau, which was near modern-day Albany, New York. And they were, the Iroquois were already trading with them. They were more than happy to trade with the Dutch. After that, the tide turned almost instantly. The Mohawk and the Iroquois in particular became pretty much the unlimited power in the Northeast for quite a long time. Because not only did they get guns, they got a lot of them and they got very good ones. The Algonquins got guns from the French and so on and so forth, but the Mohawk seemed to be more aggressive and know how to use them better. And the, you know, the traditional way of thinking is the Europeans called it a skulking form of warfare. Because they didn't believe in that, in hiding and firing from cover. They were still used to linear warfare. And again, when Samuel D. Champlain engaged the Mohawk, he changed warfare, not only in the Northeast for everyone who comes to the Americans, he pretty much changed warfare completely in the entire continent forever when it comes to Native Americans. Because once they adopted, once one adopted that type of warfare, they all adopted it because it worked. And it was typical of they would get within close range, 50 yards, it was pretty much as long a shot as they would take, they would ambush their, their enemies. Either coming towards them or if they were raiding a village they would go early early morning and before they would attack and raid the village they would get their saints around it and fire into it. Just from all sides. Well, what I plan on doing here is I want to take my reproduction dog lock here which would have been a very common gun of the time this would have been a gun you'd have seen in the late, mid to late 1600s, early 1700s, prior to the brown vest being adopted by the British. This is a carbine version. I'm going to take that at 50 yards, along with, now, the gun below it is not a flintlock, but the concept is still the same. Native Americans, when their guns would wear out, they would not throw them away. They would use them until there was nothing left to use. So if the barrel got damaged, they'd cut the barrel down and they cut the stock down. Like in this case here, the butt plate on this gun is gone. They would have used that as something like a hide scraper, a tool of some sort. The barrel on this is now 20 inches. It, even though it's a percussion gun, it is still a smooth bore. So the concept is still there. It's still gonna, it's still gonna be the same 
more or less almost the same type of gun that they would have had and used, except for the fact that this is, but the barrel, the, the size and the accuracy should be about the same. Uh, I'm going to set my little target up over here of my British soldier, even though the British really weren't the target of the Mohawk, the French were, I don't have one of them, but it'll still be pretty much a representation of a target at 50 yards. I plan, I'm, I've got enough property here I can do this safely. I'm going to kind of stuff that in behind some brush and then I'm going to take a kneeling shot as fast as I can from cover, from probably just from behind some brush, and try to repeat basically what would be as close as I can a shot that Native Americans would take. I'm not going to use a patch for any of the round balls in this. It's going to be a, pretty much a round ball. It's going to be powder, round ball, and then just wadding over the top, known as a naked round ball. That would have been as close to as possible as what the Native Americans would have used, either that or shot. I'm just going to use a round ball for each. Um, and that's what I'm going to try to do to see, and I'm going to take one individually to see where they each hit, and that's going to be type of warfare. The, there is an excellent book on the subject called Thundersticks by David Silver. I recommend that anyone is interested in how Native American warfare occurred on the, in the United States on the entire continent from the early pre basically pre-contact days right up until the firearms trade started the fur trade because once the trade started once the once the Native Americans started trading for guns it actually helped spawn the entire industry the trade industry in Europe and it fueled it here because the biggest thing Native Americans wanted didn't matter which tribe, didn't matter which side they were on, they all wanted guns. And as much guns, and if not guns, powder. And here in the Northeast, and most of the continent, it pretty much became beaver. Beaver became the main trade item for well into the 1800s, but the trade moved farther and farther west as civilization came in and as the beaver populations went down. The Hudson Bay Company actually had what was a standardization of how much it would cost to trade a pelt, well, you know, how many beaver pelts it would take to buy a gun. They wouldn't even consider money. It would be considered how many pelts would get you a certain length gun, how many pelts would get you a, how much powder, you know, for trade for powder, for shot, for flint, etc. It was that good. And the other thing is that many people think, well, the Native Americans really weren't that, really weren't that sophisticated, they weren't that smart, they they relied entirely on the Europeans. That is a, a, such a fallacy that's being disproven more and more because the Native Americans learned how to knack their own flints. They would even try to get gunsmiths to live with them. The Algonquin in Huron would actually have a French gunsmith living in living with them. He would live in their village and do all the work there on the spot. He lived with them. The, the Mohawk, if they couldn't figure it out for themselves, a lot of times if they couldn't get the British or the Dutch to do the work for them, they figured it out. They would start learning how to do it themselves and make repairs on their own guns. Maybe not complete, you know, full-on huge repairs, but enough to keep their guns going. They even learned how to build fortifications. A lot of Native Americans, by the time of the Iroquois Wars, some of them had their own cannons. They, they, would, they, had, they were a major power. The most feared power between 1601 at the start of the Iroquois Wars and the early 1700s when they ended, the most feared power in the entire Northeast was the Mohawk. Even the British were scared of them. The British knew better than to cross them because they were better armed and they could shoot better and they could do better with their guns and had better tactics than the British did. The British knew this. So they did their very best to keep them happy. Because if not, they did not want them siding with the French or anyone else. Because there were even, at one point in time, there was a small contingency of Swedish gun traders in the Northeast. They operated out of Pennsylvania and what is now modern-day Maryland. It, it was, and even into Virginia. They weren't here very long, but they were here and they at least tried to make something work. Even the, even the Russians at one point in time got involved on the West Coast. It was that important to trade guns to the Native Americans for whatever pelts they could get. But the tech, you know, again, the tactics are 
short distance, short range, ambush style warfare, and it was devastating. It was absolutely devastating to any army. And of course, Robert Rogers picked this technology up and these tactics. That's how he formed with the, with the with Rogers Rangers. uniforms that weren't red, different colors, green and brown, so that they could hide, they could blend in and fight ambush style warfare during the Revolutionary War. That was picked up by Francis Marion. The swamp box, a lot of the very same tactics. It, and of course now it's picked up and it's pretty much doctrine with modern warfare. Firing from cover if possible, camouflage, ambush style warfare. You know, it, it, and it all started from these type of tactics that the Native Americans adopted once they encountered firearms. So what I'm going to do, like I said YouTube, I'm going to do this again it's going to be the dog walk first and then the short barreled canoe gun and on the target at 50 yards. So hopefully the next video that you see will be uh, me firing at that British target. And with that being said, have a good day. Okay, YouTube, here I am. My first shot, uh, Indian warfare style. I'm about 50 yards away. I'm behind some brush. There's my target, my silhouette of the British soldier. Let's see if I can, from ambush, pull up a quick shot and fire and hit him. Okay, YouTube, well, the first shot did hit him. You can see where it hit right there, which would have been most likely a fatal a fatal wound, especially given it's a 69 caliber round ball. It would certainly have taken him out of the fight. But there is the first shot. That's with the match lock, or excuse me, the dog lock musket. That um, would have been something that Native Americans would have carried. So the next one I am going to try is going to be the small, short canoe gun, which would have been something that they would have used as well. And let's see how that works at 50 yards. Okay, YouTube, here I am for the second shot, this one being with the canoe gun. Again behind cover, again at about 50 yards approximately. And let's see what happens when I take a quick shot, see if I can hit him. Go take a look. Well, YouTube, here's I missed with the first shot with the canoe gun. Let's try a fast second shot from the same spot, same target, same distance, same mode, and see what happens if I can hit him with a quick shot. All right, YouTube, I'm hoping the third time is a charm with the canoe gun. It's missed the first two times. Let's see if I can actually hit it with it at 50 yards. I know at 35, it's usually pretty well within the area, but maybe 50 might be a little too much with this short, that's a short barrel. Let's see what happens. Well, YouTube, apparently 50 yards is too much for the canoe gun. Uh, this would have to be closer, probably 30, 35 yards, unless I was using something like buck and ball. But with a straight round ball at 50 yards with such a short barrel, it appears that uh, aiming absolutely dead center, and I know where this gun hits at 35 yards, that 50 yards is just a bit too much for it with that... Uh, Smooth round ball, because it is smooth bore barrel, just like it, just like the larger guns are. But the barrel length does appear to make a difference. 
So there it is. This would be more of a gun probably to use with uh, buckshot or buck and ball on an enemy versus just a straight round ball because obviously one's just not going to get it done because it, again if you were firing into a line of men that would be something different but one individual obviously 50 yards is just too much for a gun like this for this short barrel and again barrel length does make the difference and with that being said YouTube I'll show you real quick when I get up there and I go back over to where I was shooting from give you an idea of some of the thicker cover because there's not a lot of leaves out right now so it's mostly pines that I'm standing behind all right YouTube where I was standing and where I was shooting from actually it was kind of crouching was um, in here behind this scrub brush there's where my camera was set up I was to the left of that a bit and I was in here and behind this because there's some tree cover here mostly again it's pine a lot of leaves have not come in yet so you can kind of see most of what you back here is pine so this is where I was and this would be about a good representation as much as you can get you'd be behind cover as much as possible and if you were well hid and well camouflaged even if, even with this sparse coverage at 50 yards yeah probably somebody wouldn't notice you till the last minute it might have been too late but that was kind of my demonstration on um, Native American brush style warfare and right around 50 yards again I think with the canoe gun that would be a shorter range for the round ball and probably if I had uh, buck and ball or straight buck shot in there or just shot of any kind that would have made probably a difference but that might be something to think about that might be as far as a short range, short range weapon it's probably going to be a 30 yard gun at that it's not much more than that even for hunting or anything else so that might have been the extent of the usefulness of one of those for Native Americans but you as you could see with the dog walk musket at 50 yards it hit the target just fine and with that being said YouTube have a good day